Hey everyone, Brian Beeler, Kevin O'Brien here, talking to you today about the latest Synology release, or at least the latest one to hit our lab. There has been one announced after this, the DS1520+. Plus. Yeah, it's a 5-bay model. It's replacing previous 5-bay models. And there's some benefits and there's some drawbacks, but it just depends on what you're looking at. <laughs> okay, so it's five bay, but as you break down Synology model numbers, the 15 means that's the total maximum bays it can support. So we know that there's five on the front, but what happens is there are two eSATA ports on the back that'll give you access to two of the additional enclosures that they have that would add five drives each. So we get to 15. Yeah. And if you multiply that by, what, 16 or 18 terabytes, that's a big number. So yeah. if you're just looking for beefy capacity and you think your workloads might grow, this particular unit does really well there, and the 20 being the, the uh, year it was released. And plus normally means it's a little extra souped yeah, up. Yeah, they've usually, uh, the plus models have generally had more expansion or a higher performance than the non-plus models. Okay, and in this case, we're not going to get that. So we'll work through that uh, as we take a look at it. And actually, why don't we get to that now, Kevin, is we, we talked about it on the front of the unit, like you said, uh, five bays, you've got your USB and uh, power button, your normal blinky lights on the front, right? Yeah, and it, this this particular model looks uh, quite quite a lot like the uh, uh, the 720, which uh, shares a lot of the same form factors, a lot of the same type of base uh, trays, things like that. But just fewer bays. Yeah, two instead of five. And then as you slide it around the back, you've got the two uh, eSATA ports I talked about. Save your comment on the power supply for a second. Four gigabit LAN and. That's it. So let's talk networking first because that's an issue. Yeah. So on the uh, DS uh, 1517 Plus that this guy's replacing, you were given one uh, edge card slot and mm. you could put a dual port 10 gig card in that. You could put uh, their uh, single port 10 gig and NVMe expansion card right, in that. Combo so card, would, sure. Yeah. And you were left with options to expand. And that was a there was a differentiation factor between the plus models and the non pluses. And so as we look at the back of this, our options to expand are what? Zero. Okay. Just wanted to be clear on that. And, and Kevin's also a little salty about the power supply. Yeah. So the previous models, when you moved up into uh, this range, uh, this class of model had an internal power supply because you didn't want to deal with a massive power transformer. Now that's out of the system. It gets you a smaller case. But then you're stuck dealing with where does the power supply go and... Yeah, I don't know. It doesn't bother me as much as you, but I understand that as you look at the system compared to the, uh, what would it be, the 1517 plus, the prior it loses, edition... It seems like it loses some of its premium feel. Went backwards a little bit. Yeah. Um, okay, so why don't we go straight into looking at some of the performance numbers uh, that we found? Because again, here is where you saw some peculiar behavior, and I actually, I neglected to say on, on the bottom, we've got the two NVMe ports, which are built in, uh, and you're gonna talk about that here as part of the performance, because we ran the Synology drives in there, but didn't always see the benefit of the uh, of the SSDs. Yeah, and to take one step back, uh, right now, uh, currently across the board, uh, the only way you'd be able to have a all flash um, volume or iSCSI LUN uh, would be to use uh, SAT SSDs in place of the normal hard drive uh, bays and build a RAID 1, RAID 5, etc. type mm -hmm. of uh, volume. The NVMe bays or slots um, in this model and any of the other Synology models are only used for cache. Right. So you're even if it's even on the <clears throat> model supporting NVMe, you're still limited by the caching algorithm. And from what we've found, it doesn't always perform well under high stress. Okay. So in this uh, benchmark, uh, for example, we're looking at uh, 4K random uh, read and write performance. Uh, the smaller numbers over here are uh, just the RAID 6 uh, over 5 uh, disk volumes, or 5-disk bays. And these are uh, WD Red 14 terabyte, just for clarity, on the 5 hard drives. And we've got the two uh, Synology uh, M.2 2280. Uh, form factor and VME SSDs in for cache. Yeah, and as we move over to the cache side, and this, by the way, we pre-warm, uh, and uh, after it's fully populated, we run the uh, benchmark. And here, CIFS, uh, the SIFS workload was able to get uh, around 22,000 IOPS on the read. Yeah, but dear Lord, the 35... ice scuzzy. What happened there? 
Yeah, so this peculiarity we're starting to see in other areas. So uh, I'll scroll down to a little bit, but under the higher loads, the uh, 4K uh, or the read performance uh, through the cache side starts to act as if it's having just massive misses and actually performs less than non-cache. That's suboptimal, I think, when you're looking at a caching device, especially when you're going to slam a couple hundred dollars and flash into the bottom of this thing. Yeah, so we've uh, we've seen this before, uh, but to show you another area where this starts to uh, come out, our um, AK7030 workload where we scale the uh, thread and queue depth, uh, and by the way, the 4K workload is 16 thread, 16 queue, so it's similar to what you'd find over on this side. Here in the iSCSI uh, AK7030 workload, in the at the start, it kind of picks up. As soon as the load starts to increase, that guy is uh, around queued up 32, and then at the peaks, it's uh, at the peak load, performance mm -hmm. starts to drop, and then as it reaches a certain point, it just tapers off. Do you think how much of this could be due to the Celeron inside just not having enough muscle to contend with these workloads? So that's another drawback. The 1517 had a higher performance CPU. You were given a uh, Intel Atom with uh, it was a four. It was a four core, 2.4 gigahertz CPU. This new model is a four core, uh, two gigahertz Celeron. So there's okay. some performance limitations there. Not that uh, I'm not, I don't think this model really got CPU saturated for these workloads. Right. But um, I mean, it, it really comes back to the, you had certain performance elements that were in past models that are being kind of pulled away. And then, yeah, and it's to maintain pricing, though, right? That's what it comes down to. And for Synology to be able to offer some stratification in their line, although the big problem here is that if you want to get 10 gig in and out of this thing, you're kind of limited on options. You've got to go up to like an 1819 plus and then add the card. So now you're talking over a grand probably in total cost or some of the new models that are a little more uh, small enterprise or, or you know small robo kind of uh, situated that have 10 gig on board, but now you're well past doubling the price of, of this 1520 plus. Yeah, and from other vendors, you have seen multi gig starting to uh, come on board in addition to a 10 gig port. So it seems like there might be some missed opportunities here, but it might just come down to price. They might not have a lot of room left, so they're trying to still hit that same price point without uh, right. really breaking the bank. So, I mean, speaking of the 10 gig port, did you find anything where you were really limited or that limited by the four one gig ports you have on this thing? So the only area that really uh, gets hit with uh, out having 10 gig is the uh, large block sequential transfer. So in here, uh, we, across the board, it maxes out at like 440, 450 megabytes per second, which it's basically just saturating the uh, four 10 gig or the four one gig ports. Right, and so if you're doing a lot of file transfers or media files or you know, a lot of in and out of big PowerPoints or PDFs, this is where you might feel a little bit of pain on on that. Yeah, or if it was like a backup target or something. Yeah. You're, so you're long, just... long sequential backup target writes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, it, it, it also, you get to a multi-tenancy thing too, where 10 gig might help you if you're under just a heavier load of, you know, not just two or three users, but a hundred or whatever that are that are all hammering this thing at once with large files. Yeah, so I think in the past, if you saw the uh, 1517 series, for example, as an upper end of prosumer, maybe light uh, SMB um, or even light uh, enterprise, this model seems to differentiate more uh, closer towards the prosumer side than it would uh, small business or uh, uh, light enterprise. One thing that they do really good job of though always is DSM. And I know we've looked at DSM a couple times. You've got it fired up here. Why don't we just take a quick look again for those that may not be familiar uh, with the Synology operating environment. It's still really, really good. Yeah, there are a ton of apps and the uh, the interface, um, it's had improvements over the years, but you can also say it hasn't had dramatic changes over the years. So if you're familiar with past models, the new Pretty experience, much the same, yeah. it looks, uh, or a lot of things are in similar spots, but it looks a lot nicer, but you're not left with an interface that is dramatically different OSs over the years. Right. Um, but you, you're able to uh, add in uh, multiple packages. So uh, you're able to separate out by uh, Synology software versus uh, other third-party applications. 
uh, and then even like beta applications, depending on what you want to go into. Well, yeah, in terms of depth, I mean, QNAP has been cranking out a bunch of new stuff, but Synology in terms of apps and integrations, I think still the, the leader. Right? Yeah, it's definitely cleaner. Um, not to say that there might not be, I mean, they can both cloud sync, they can both do a lot of the elements, but it seems like the refinement of okay. the uh, DSM uh, software is a lot nicer. And then in terms of storage, I mean, you. What have you done to this thing? Yeah, this guy got uh, power yanked from it. But again, I mean, this goes back into the, it keeps it uh, reliable and functional to the end user. It's doing a parity check. So it's just making sure everything, even if, even though it was idle when it was off and whatnot. I Kevin's yank. favorite methodology for powering down systems is to yank the uh, power cord out of the back. Yeah, it, Unceremoniously, it, it I might add. It protects you from yourself. Uh, you could just hit the power button. Yes. Okay. Uh, but you've got the drives, you've got the SSD cache, you've got all the other goodies in here set up. You want to do a quick tour just through storage pools and SSDs and such so people yeah. can see that. So in here we have our uh, just in our 40 terabytes of uh, storage uh, over our RAID 6 volume. Um, and we, ha we can see our individual disks. And these guys are the uh, two cache devices located on the bottom of the unit. They're the 400 gig. Uh, Synology uh, NVMe M.2s. And, and this is not insignificant because when you see performance data with those cliffs, you might think, okay, well, wow, maybe a drive's bad or, or throwing errors and that's causing the problem. Yeah, but in here we can see everything's checking healthy. Everything has uh, nice uh, smart scans. Do they offer a more intensive drive check on, uh, on the hard drives? Um, not really. It's more just coming down to the quick test, extended test for the individual hard drives, and then at the uh, pool level, you can kick off uh, scans and scrubs. Okay. But uh, for an individual drive, it really comes down to what is it presenting to the OS if it's starting to throw bad sectors or um, uh, read errors. That's where you start getting red flags that a drive is going on the way out. So overall, it's a strong unit if capacity is perhaps more important to you than IO. Yeah. And if you were to recommend NVMe SSDs for this for most use cases, you're probably on the no side of the fence. Well, they they still make sense for certain workloads. Uh, I don't know if there's a huge advantage to going towards the largest of drives, but having it in there to help give it some boost is uh I mean, so maybe a couple low-cost alternatives. Yeah. Okay. So maybe a couple low-cost alternatives in the bottom. You've got your four gig uh, ports on the back. And then, like we said at the top, you can still add two five-bay uh, expansion chassis to this. So it's still good from a data growth standpoint. If you were starting out uh, at, a, at an office or, or re replacing some legacy storage with this in a uh, small office, dental office, whatever, and think that your data footprint might grow, this is a better fit than some of the other uh, mid-range Synology units that don't have the, the eSATA port expansion on the back. Yeah. So at least you get that. You get pr relatively good performance. Um, caching sort of hit or miss. Well, yeah. yeah that was Storage puns, yeah. Yeah, that was pretty good. And uh, overall, it's a decent unit, but there might be better fits in the portfolio uh, if you want to stay with Synology. So just make sure to check uh, the other plus units and some of the light enterprise or the light SMB uh, units because you might just find a better set of features there depending on what you want. Thanks for tuning in. Bye-bye.